moving, so I don't have anything to do here. Please raise your hand, that's okay. I'll work with you. Um, can, can you check the microphone? Do you have the microphone? There's a microphone, right. All right. Is it on? Yeah. Cool. So, that's going to be complicated because those kind of microphones go really, really bad with long beard. Weird stuff while I'm talking like this. I apologize. <laughs> All right. So, uh, creating offline IoT um, experience with beacons. Who has ever played with the beacons before? One guy. Good, good. Who has no idea what a beacon is? Nice. <laughs> that's good news because I have some stuff about beacons. So, that's who I am. My name is Laurent, as I said, I'm the counterpart of William Heng, who is a cash based developer advocate based in New York. Uh, that submitted this talk about beacons. I'm based in Paris. You can find me on Twitter, you can send me an email. That's a tag cloud of stuff I like, but that's enough about me because we're already late. So, what's a beacon? Um, that's a lighthouse. A lighthouse emits a signal to anyone that wants to see that signal. It's just broadcasting to the world. It's not broadcasting something in particular like you would have with uh, Wi-Fi people on the network, uh, Wi-Fi, you know, this kind of thing. It's just, hey, here's a signal, and do whatever you want with it. If you're on a boat, then that's, that's, that's great, because that's what you want. You want a signal to help you in the context of where you are, which is on the sea, to find where you're going, which is port. Oh. So that's what a beacon is. The beacon we want to talk about today looks more like this. This is a small piece of hardware. There's different size of beacons. Those are common ones from common beacons company. And what they all have in common is this thing that they run on Bluetooth LE. The full version of Bluetooth. So it's low energy. With a, I guess with a key of that size, you can, that's, that's probably that, that big. Um, battery can last up to two, three years because Beacon doesn't broadcast much information. It broadcasts a UID. <coughs> it broadcasts free aid. A UID, like a 16 byte big, non-human readable UID. And two additional ID, major version, minor version. That's the uh, iBeacon version. iBeacon is the uh, Apple standard of Beacon introduced by Apple, but that was like, I don't know, three or four years ago, maybe more. I'm pretty new to that beacon stuff. Before William told me it existed, I had no idea what it was. So th I'm, I'm a two weeks old baby in terms of beacon. So I think it's four, three, four years old. Uh, it's an Apple thing, but of course it's uh, it's Bluetooth, right? So everything that works with Bluetooth, it works with it. It works. And as I said, there's uh, a UID, two different <coughs> versions in the minor version. There's two other stuff that you find in most beacon standards. There's a byte to tell you about the range of the beacon you want it to work. From a range perspective, a beacon like this, Bluetooth cell is about 50 meters, and you can decide of that range, you can configure that range using that off byte. So it's very much used for indoor stuff. Like GPS is something outdoors. You know how a GPS works, pretty much the same thing, it's broadcasting some stuff. It's localizing something, but it's outdoors. There is no uh, limit of range satellite. Wi-Fi has a broader limit of range. NFC has a very small range limit, probably at 10, 10 centimeters. Uh, RFID is probably about 100 centimeters, so it's quite uh, small too. The uh, best, from a size perspective, way of emitting something is Bluetooth, and it's low energy. It's much less consuming than Wi-Fi. So yes, they have a bike to tell you to configure the range of emission of a beacon. There's another bike that can be used to maybe tell you about the battery of the beacon. And then some other standards like Alt Beacon or Ediston Beacon. Yeah. Alt Beacon, Ediston Beacon. Ediston is the one on the bottom. It's a Google thing. It's new. It started a year ago. Uh, and it allows you to broadcast actually more, much more information. One of the interesting things with Beacon is telemetry. It's a good use case. 
you telemetry is basically broadcasting one stuff, which is a temperature, a battery level, uh, just a, a small sensor that gives you one thing at one time. Um, so that's where it is. It's a beacon. It's just emitting stuff, which is nice. But if you don't have an app that works with that beacon, then it's absolutely useless. Uh, so obviously you have to write an app that knows the UID of the beacon, the different version number of the beacon, and when it receives that signal, it can do stuff. So quickly, some use cases about uh, beacon. Uh, there was a lot of people that very excited in marketing and sales about enriching the user experience of people based on the context. What that means is, <coughs> if you're on a store <coughs> and you're walking around the store with your phone app and getting close to a beacon, then you might have a notification that says, hey, this thing on the right is on sales, 50% sales for people that have the app. Okay. So it, it, it lets you give notification, give something back to a user based on where he is, usually indoors. It can serve other purpose. If you tend to lose stuff, you know, like a, a VGA Mac adapter that happened, <laughs> maybe you could add a beacon on this thing, and your phone will know what that beacon is. And when the beacon, which is your adapter, is good, not in range anymore with your phone, your phone will say, you just lost your damn thingy. It's not on my range anymore. Where is it? I'd walk with Kering, that walk with other stuff, that walk with a bike, you put that on a bike, go grab a beer, and then if your phone is saying your bike is moving, then someone is probably stealing your bike. Um, great use case, you're in a museum, and you have the, the, the app open, and you walk among the very cool thing in the museum, and each time you walk next to your beacon, the beacon tells you, okay, so that's what it is, that's who made this beautiful art thing, and that's why you did it. Information in context of where you are. Tracking sounds bad, but you know that could perfectly be used for tracking, tracking stuff in your uh, Amazon big thing where they store stuff, places where they store things. Uh, they use RFID tag to actually uh, locate. You could also use. Uh, um, Telemetry, scavenger hunts, when you go to conferences, they want you, you, you take the app of the conference and they want to make sure that you go to every place you have to go to. So each time you approach a beacon with your app, your app will say, oh, you've been here. So that's sort of a gamif gamification thing. Uh, you enforce them. You're completely lost. My first time. Who, who is this first time I forced them here? That's my first time. Okay. I got lost so many times already today. Beacon could help. You know, if you have a venue uh, map on the app and it can actually tell you based on people where you are and what to do, that, that would be nice. Because I got lost. Anyway. Question is, what's uh, Couchbase Developer Advocate doing here? Because I'm working for a NoSQL company, a working database. I have no reason to be here. Well, we have this thing called uh, Couchbase Mobile and it's here to have only one problem, which is no bars. No problem, no bars as no reception on your phone, you're out of network, you don't have anything anymore. You, you, if you have an app that relies just on the internet, then your app doesn't work. So it's a wonderful animation to explain that to you. You're connected to the cloud because you have network that great. You have a very poor reception that's less great. And from a user perspective, waiting, everybody hates that. You don't have network anymore. Mm. And then your app doesn't work because it you know, requires to be online. So if your beacon app, when you find a beacon, requires you to do a call to the server and say, what am I supposed to do with that beacon? And you have no internet connection, that means be that beacon is useless. Because again, it's just emitting an ID. Say, hey, I'm a beacon, my name is that thing, I'm version 1.2, please do something. But then if you don't have any internet connection, you can't do something. So usually from a mobile app perspective, you end up having a very frustrated, frustrated user because the app doesn't work because you have no network. It's, it has to be online to work. And it's the same for several beacon apps. Your app has to be online to get the info that's supposed to show you based on the idea of the beacon. 
that's a very generic definition of cash-based model. <coughs> People uninstall stuff because your app sucks, because it's freezing, crashing, or because it's slow. Usually slow can be uh, associated with having no network. Sometimes it doesn't even work. The problem is data allocation. To make this work, you have to be, you have to have, sorry, local data, and be able to sync the data when you have network, when you're online. So that's the, that's the idea to make it to have the best user experience possible. <coughs> There's too many animation on the slides, and then you have a very happy user that gives you a great rating and that will keep on using your app, which is great. So again, what am I doing here? We have this thing called cache-based mobile. It's based on two things, cache-based data and sync gateway. Cache-based data is an embedded database. So when you run this database in your app, on your phone, or on the Raspberry, or, or anything, if you're not connected to the internet, that's fine. You have a local database, you have the data. And then once you're connected to the internet, maybe you want to get an update on what the data is. Because Beacon, as I said, is just this thing that's going to stay for two or three years, depending on the battery life of the thing. And maybe you want to repurpose that Beacon. Let's take that uh, supermarket example again. You're walking down the alley, and then this notification that says, oh, this product is on sale. Once this product is fully sold, you probably need to display another notification using the same Beacon, because you're not going to replace every Beacon this time you have to very expensive. So you have to repurpose your beacon. In order to do that, if that data was on the local database, then you need to sync back to the server and get the new definition, the new message to display based on what's now on sale. That's what we have the sync gateway, which is an app server, basically, that syncs the local database to the online big cache-based NoSQL server. That's what it does. That's how you do offline stuff with Beacon, basically. I took off my talk here. I'm not going to, because I have 10 minutes to do a demo and talk more about Cash Mobile. Um, Cash Base Lite, four important things. It's document based. When you store something in that local database, you just store a JSON file. And a JSON file, from a Java perspective, is just a map of string and object. So this is extremely normal, basic stuff. There's no SQL or anything, you're just taking one object, a JSON, and storing it in the database. Which is great, because now everybody's speaking about JSON. You know, all the HTTP API, REST API, they all speak JSON. You don't have any XML database, because XML is dying, you have JSON stuff. If you have a database, usually what you want to do is query the content of that database. Cache slides allow you to query the content of the JSON based on what we call an incremental map reduce function. Ugh. <coughs> Who knows what MapReduce is, and should I explain MapReduce quickly? That was were two separate questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. I will explain anyway. A map function takes a document, like a JSON file, and allows you to do something with it, like add an entry to an index, which is exactly what we're doing here when we write um, an incremental MapReduce function. Each time you add or modify or delete a document in the database, we will run the map function on that thing, that document, and if dog.types equals uh, beacon visit, then emit entry in index whatever. You've created an index, which is basically a two column table. There's a key, there's a value, and you can query that. That's how you query the content of the JSON file with cache size. Two other important things that lightning thing is here to tell you that this is all event driven in the sense that you don't have to, it's fully asynchronous. You don't have to tell the server, hey, give me the update, wait for the update to happen, then have the update, then do the query again. Uh, it's, there's a listener model, basically. So you can listen to document changes and do stuff while they change. It's important to have this model because when you go offline and online again, there's one thing that can happen that happens often, you have some uh, synchronization issue. I've updated the document while offline. Someone updated it already and sync the updated version on the server. But there's a newer version online than 
the one I have on my phone and that I updated. So I have a conflict, <coughs> and the good thing is, with a listener model like this, you can listen to conflicts, and when you have a conflict, then you can decide what to do with the conflict. Am I gonna override anything, everything? Am I gonna do merge based on the content of my document? There is no way to do automatic conflict uh, merge because that's very tight to your business model, so there's really nothing you can do from an automatic perspective. So with the listener, we give you the ability to decide how to merge this uh, conflicting document. And then the other part with the uh, real sign is the sync gateway. You can sync the content of your local database to the server side of things, which is basically saying when you're online, you can get you can update your database because when you're offline, you still want everything to work. Which is why I'm here, because offline is important because you don't have network all the time. Let's say you are a music festival, there's beacon everywhere to basically track where people are going. When you are at a music festival, you try using your phone and call your friend. There's, there's, everybody's doing this, so the network doesn't work. There's no internet, it's, it's a fact. In IT conferences, it works better. I'm actually surprised that the Wi-Fi here works pretty well. But when it doesn't work, you still want to know where people go. So when you're walking around with your phone and the app as a service in the background that's basically storing every time you go next to a beacon, we can store that offline. And then when you go back online one day because you finally got the internet back because you got back home from the festival, then you can send all your information to uh, the database, the festival people. And now they can say, oh, there was way too many weights in this area or we should probably make that thing bigger or whatever. Quick sample of code, uh, iOS version, Android version, as I said, a JSON file is just a map or a dictionary. There's a key, there's a fill, <coughs> very simple. I have five minutes to talk about a single gateway, which I'm not gonna do. I'm gonna use those five minutes to hopefully do a working demo, which is always this weird thing to say, working demo. How do you test those Beacon thing. There's many ways to do that. Basically, what you require is a, a Bluetooth uh, thing. I have a Raspberry Pi with a Bluetooth key. And I was supposed to plug this somewhere with my battery that I have here, so I'm not going to do it anyway. But I have another Bluetooth key here. So I'm running this uh, image called the uh, Visual Beacon, which is just a, a Debian uh, instance that allow you to transmit stuff. Like, hey, I'm a beacon, get my data. So I run out beacon transmit. Hopefully this will work, which now don't, and it's frozen, but that's okay. I will <coughs> run my Android virtual machine, which hopefully also has, that's my uh, small micro with the Bluetooth key. It's gonna run. just picked up my beacon that say Debian Hello VM Beacon, which is cool, good. What I want to do now is pretend that uh, the beacon purpose has uh, changed. <coughs> so I'm going to repurpose my beacon by updating my document, <coughs> which is a JSON document is working. Hmm. Don't do demos at Toby, never work. Uh, what's wrong? So the goal of that demo was I'm assuming I have network issues. But it's a local on your machine. Yes, it is. 
need to be on the same network as everyone. It lives on the network and should work. Can can you try the first them first them fallback? supposed to happen is I was supposed to go on the same gateway <coughs> documents <Yay>. no <laughs> <laughs> take my user the other user look at that document that said Debian hello VM Bacon and Beacon and let's say for them Save the document, so I'm repurposing my beacon. Go back to my app, launch the damn thing, and see that it's not saying, it's, it's now saying, call them something, somewhere, which is not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what was gonna happen. And it's not happening for some reason. And I don't know why. Unfortunately, I cannot show you code, but as I said, the code is pretty straightforward. You have database objects, you have a map, you store the map in the database, done. And then you have this thing called a push replication or a pull replication, which is to say I'm pushing data to the server or pulling data to the server. What's supposed to happen here is I'm pulling data through the SYN gateway to the local database to repurpose my beacon. And that doesn't work because I have networking issue. And I'm sad, and I should have done a video. As I said, I think you have a thing. So that's it. Thank you very much for your thanks. I'm going to do a little tour.
The reason is uh, when we when I when I look back, these platforms are as different as you can imagine, and pretty much in all respects. <laughs> and uh, I would like to highlight those differences and uh, how we tackle them. So I'll give you an overview. Uh, some of you may know. Uh, for those who don't, uh, CC thirty two hundred is uh, um, is an um, system on a chip with Wi-Fi uh, capability from um, the Texas Instruments, which is a, a major vendor. This is their IoT play. They, they very much, uh, there is like, all the resources, like resources of a big corporation are behind this, and uh, this is their push into IoT. Uh, they use a well-known, uh, uh, they well-known ARM, um, a well-known processor. It's an ARM core, that's some core core, uh, with an interesting architecture, which, which shows that uh, it's, uh, having everything on one chip, uh, which means a radio and uh, application processor, is not common. Uh, usually, it's like an, um, you have an RF chip and you have your uh, application chip, and this this one integrates them on the on the same die. Uh, but um, it's they are still kind of separate because you have two actually two separate cores. One is called network processor. It's a CC3100 network processor and uh, application processor uh, on the side. They are connected internally by SPI. <coughs> But otherwise, you do not actually get to program the network processor. It's like it's a black box which you talk to uh, over SPI. Um, it has a fairly beefy uh, two, 256k of RAM. It doesn't have any built-in flash. Uh, it uses uh, external SPI chip. Um, so yeah, it uses uh, Wi-Fi. It actually has all the pretty much all the features you expect from this, uh, from a chip like this. I do see SPI interfaces to uh, serial UARTs, uh, pulse width modulation, timers, hardware uh, accelerated crypto, RTC, four analog converters. So uh, all the peripherals, all the usual peripherals are there. The SDK, uh, um, whatever I say next, I'm going to commend the TI on their SDK uh, because it's uh, really, really good. Um, it has, it's, where it's well documented, it's actually, all of the SDK is c completely, <coughs> apart from their proprietary TI RTOS, which I don't know why would, why would you use, um, they ship complete um, sources for free RTOS, all the build configuration, so you can rebuild, um, so th they ship binary blobs for sure, but you can rebuild all the contents from sources, which uh, like is very commendable, um, and we use that to reduce footprint somewhat. So that's that's all good. Uh, the hardware, I mean, data sheets. Um, you know, what, can, what else can you what, what can you ask? When I was implementing I2C driver, um, I actually could go and read um, everything about how to how to drive the, the, the module, the SP internal I2C module. Like this is, and this was after my ESP experience. This was like ah, uh, anyway. Um, so the price though is uh, to build. So so what what you buy is you can buy a chip. Uh, itself, and, um, but what you usually buy is a module that you plug on your PCB. Um, this one doesn't have integrated antenna, so you actually have to trace the antenna as well, which is a bit of a pain. Uh, but basically, it's $25 on DigiKey and uh, about half that, like kind of non-official alternative module on AliExpress. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of the, the industry standard. However, this is the newcomer. This is the interesting uh, thing. We, they are kind of an accidental IoT success uh, by a small Chinese vendor. I will show you how they started. Um, this is uh, from um, from what they started. Um, so it's it's kind of obvious when, when you look into this that they didn't intend to become an IoT vendor, but they did. Um, so it's a fully custom design. The silicon is fully custom designed by the company CEO, who is um, who did a really good job. Like the hardware is top notch. Um, it uses uh, like a, uh, an um, uh, I think a, a modular uh, f for the CPU part. So RF is all custom designed because this company CEO is uh, in the um, uh, in the past an RF designer. So, uh, but the uh, CPU parts are kind of uh, from the building blocks of uh, a call of a thing called Extensa. It's an 80 slash 160 megahertz. You can uh, overclock to 120 <coughs> megahertz. Uh, it has a uh, 96k of data RAM, instruction RAM. Um, it does. It also doesn't have any built-in flash. Um, it is SPI only, but with a very, very useful feature that it does have a rudimentary MMU. 
uh, by which I, uh, you can translate directly, address space is directly translated onto SPI with obvious performance impact, but with some uh, <coughs> 32K cache behind it, so it's not terrible. It's in practice, it's fine. Um, so, but uh, being a relatively, relatively obscure instruction, instruction set, the, the open source, of course, the, the, the company behind Extensa, they sell uh, proprietary compilers, but we are not interested in that here, right? Um, so, uh, GCC toolchain is, um, up until very recently, was uh, like a one-man effort by uh, a, an employee of the company, but still, <coughs> it's just one person. And GDB support is still kind of shaky. Uh, one interesting thing it supports uh, is it can run AP and the station at the same time, um, so which which is kind of useful on different channels also. Uh, so it does have it, it doesn't have uh, a, as rich set of peripherals because as I said it does wasn't I think I don't think it was intended as a like a general purpose. Uh, what it was intended really is to provide a, like a Wi-Fi shield for. Uh, for your uh, for your IoT, IoT projects, <coughs> it uh, curiously <coughs> does, it does have I2S, but it doesn't have I2C internally. It has SPI. It has one and a half yards <coughs> because uh, one of them you cannot really use because it's multiplexed to pins that are used for SPI flash. Uh, well, you can only use TX, but not RX. Um, so um, it's kind of weird. It has one ADC that is one at zero to one volt uh, range. Um, not very useful. So you have to have an external divider. Um, now, the software side of it is completely, as I said, like it's complete opposite of um, of uh, TI in quality uh, because it plainly it sucks. There are two SDKs and both of them suck. One sucks more, the other sucks relatively less. Um, but um, given the, <coughs> the origins, I think it's explainable uh, because, as I said, it didn't intend to become, and I'll go into a bit of more detail about that. Uh, there is absolutely zero data sheets. Like data sheets are unknown in this space. Um, all you get, the best you can get, is headers and then kind of guess and then some examples. And so you can kind of deduce what the hardware does, but zero data sheets. None. That's, that's just not unknown. However, what's interesting about that is that the module, as I said, is that you plug into your uh, project to get the Wi-Fi connectivity, and it includes uh, antenna on the module as well. Is under two dollars on AliExpress. So that gets people interested, and um, so this is the this is the ESP01. This is the very first device where they, this is what became popular. Um, uh, as you see, that there is an SPI flash chip and, uh, and the processor itself. Uh, as you can see, there are only like this is the Wi-Fi shield. It has RX, TX. Um, um, it has the uh, supply voltage and the programming. Pin. That's it. There is no. There, it's not intended to be connected by peripherals. However, people got interested. They reverse engineered it, um, and uh, the, the company the, the company actually picked up on it um, and became like went into uh, IoT space. Decided to release SDK. Their first efforts were really miserable. Um, so, but what you get with this is really not enough. So you get two GPIOs, and if you want more, people were doing this. So this is what you do for <laughs> GPIOs. But uh, yeah, th there was enough interest that this is this was actually good enough. Um, however, uh, we are we are past that. So this is the uh, this is the latest module that gives you all the break, breaks out all the pins that you can really get from this, um, um, and it's, it has they, they have subsequently got the FCC certification and CE certification. So it's all kosher now. Um, so this is what you can buy for under two dollars. Uh, now, uh, so what I'm going to tell you, so the origin, yeah, it's. Um, as, as opposed to the uh, explicit IoT push by TI, uh, this started with a module that got reversed, or engineered by the community, and um, it's just uh, it's just interesting that the company so they didn't they didn't fight it. They decided hmm, maybe there is something in this IoT thing. Um, so they started releasing SDKs, uh, but they they weren't very good. Like I mean, I, I, they just don't know what fu function declaration is. Like I mean, if you it, it's obviously um, okay, they. they they just don't declare the functions like they don't need it. They just ignore the warnings that you have uh, that you use. Uh, um, WIO. What? When you do WIO, you get all the warnings. Uh, you get warnings like it's all it's terrible, but you don't do that and it's all fine, right? So you just use a function. You know it's there. Ignorance is a bliss. Yeah. So exactly. Uh, but it's it, like it's been it, 
it's been going from version to version. They use a function and they just don't declare it. The thing does not compile with, w, uh, with, with all warnings, so you have to declare them yourself. Um, they well, you can try submitting patches to them, by the way. They, they are not very, uh, they are not very, they don't have um, ex, uh, open source, repo well, they're not very receptive to patches, I shall say. Um, anyway, so the use, the, so the whole SDK is a bunch of binary blobs, but it is based on things like XTLS, uh, LWIP, uh, which they don't ship headers for. Uh, instead, for example, for networking, they build something like uh, that's called ESPCon, ESP uh, uh, connection library, whatever, which is an, another layer on top of LWIP, because uh, LWIP is not good enough, I guess, with these two APIs, I don't know why. Anyway, this thing just sucks. It uh, um, you just shouldn't use it. So we finally, finally, one thing we persuaded them to do is to just release the uh, headers for the LWIP. Yay! <laughs> uh, so now you can completely bypass this thing and just use LWIP, and it's, it, it all works. Um, the, the the state of WTF is really amazing. Like this, as I said, the documentation for this is uh, spread all over the for forums. A different uh, code repositories with examples, reverse engineered ROM. Um, I mean, it's just. Uh, however, as I said, the community has been very excited by the, I guess, the price point, and uh, it's actually the hardware. Is, hardware is really neat. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, commending them on the TI is somewhat, um, uh, somewhat strange on hardware. The ESP is uh, like it, it's beautifully designed hardware. <coughs> I wish it was documented better. Um, so um, I, let me let me go to CC thirty two hundred so I can tell you. Right. So right from the beginning with CC thirty two hundred, uh, what we ran into is that you cannot flash the thing without some stupid Windows tool. Like this is, I mean. Um, so we used uh, we took um, there is an actually an open um, uh, development platform called the uh, Energia, which is a fork of Arduino, and they ship like kind of half-assed um, flashing tool which lets you just flash one file and that's it. Um, so we weren't quite happy with that, although we, we did use it for um, uh, in the beginning. So we reverse engineered the protocol and we integrated, uh, we, we, we shipped implementation in our own flashing tool. Um, so at least that's all, but it's kind of, like why would it, there isn't even a Mac version. Okay, and we are used to not having Linux versions, um, but uh, not even a Mac version, what, what, what the hell really? Um, now, the, the fail of fast story is quite interesting. So, the flash uh, on, on CC3200 is uh, it's like it's not a flat address space with blobs, it's actually a file system. Um, but uh, the problem with this file system is it's really, um, you cannot do much. So you have to, I mean, it's, uh, you, so first of all, you cannot access the flash other than through this file system. This is a problem. Um, if you want to, for example, store things that you don't know the size of in advance, and on this file system, you create a file and you declare the, file, the size in advance. Um, also, you can only open files for writing with truncation, so it's like there, there is no append, there is no, um, there is no open for read and write. No, just it open for writing, it's not truncate. Um, so that was really, and with SmartJS in particular, we provide a file API. So for this, um, and there are there are also there are strange uh, other strange things. For example, when you open the file for writing, it does look like a, because it's on flash, so there are certain semantics that can only you can only reset bits and not set them. It will let you do random writes, thankfully, uh, but it will have this weird semantics that um, you can only reset bits. So it's not really writing; it's resetting bits from the write. Uh, but never mind that. Um, so what we instead did, uh, it's basically. Um, it's very clear that with SmartJS, our primary goal is to um, kind of uh, to smoothen the bumps, you know. So we provide what looks like a POSIX a, a file API, and to do that, we actually implemented uh, um, uh, SPIPS, which is a SPI flash file system inside the container files on this uh, file FS. Um, and uh, yeah, that was we have a, have a blog post about that. But. Um, uh, basically, they acknowledge the problems with the file system, but they say they will not fix it because this product is now, it, they don't add features, and uh, apparently um, opening file without truncation is a feature. Um, right. Um, 
Well, they are active on the forum, by the way. They do, they do interact. Uh, both of them actually have forums. Both of them interact, and TI is actually quite responsive. The problem is the responses are often, OK, it's OK, wait for next year. Not good enough. Uh, and there are the biggest problem with TI is that, um, is that uh, the RAM. 256K seems like a lot. Um, but the problem is that it doesn't have an internal flash, so it loads all the code into RAM. So your code and data and uh, RAM is shared. So the 256K is all you get, uh, which is really not good enough for our for our purposes because our firmware is quite fat. We have to fit all the, the, the JavaScript interpreter, the libraries, the things, and have so still have some memory left for, for application use. Um, but there is really no way around it. Uh, it's just 200, so what it does is it, uh, the, the bootloader loads the, the firmware image, lets it run, and then, well, you can, it's basically, there is no memory, there is no, no memory mapping of any sort. Um, there is no memory protection that you, so you could implement some, um, uh, uh, it's, it's basically, it, it's a dead end. We, we, we reached a dead end that we uh, ran out of code space and now we, we cannot add features to SmartJS because of this, uh, or it's either, so we would have to go to something like, you know, DOS overlay days to, to, to implement something like that. But we, we, we just don't want to do it. Um, <laughs> so that's, uh, that kind of sucks. It's like a, it's a big problem for us. Um, the, the problem is that Cortex uh, A4 core lacks any kind of memory management unit. They didn't think about implementing it. <coughs> Usually uh, the controllers have embedded flash that just sits on the system bus. So it's like direct on map. It's all good. But here it's SPI, it doesn't have any direct mapping as uh, the, the kind of that ESP does. And um, yeah, it's it, it really a big disadvantage in that, uh, in that way. Um, so, and I actually went through everything pretty quickly. Let me see, I have uh, five more minutes. So yeah, that's <laughs> a, the, the option is that we managed to, um, in the end, we managed to, uh, to, to a certain extent, that you don't see all this, like all this terrible um, tragedy of ESP SDK, or like you get the same uh, J JavaScript environment on both platforms, and uh, we, we suffered, so you don't have to. Um, this is an, a graph of popularity, though. So you see why it makes uh, it's. Uh, so see the both platforms uh, um, started even the the CC two hundred <coughs> had a bit of a head start on ESP, but you can see. Uh, the interest, uh, the relative interest in both platforms. Um, and um, this is, um, I mean, the, the suffering uh, through all the idiosyncrasies was worth it because it's, there is incredible uh, community around the ESP. Um, and we, so what's next? Uh, the ESP32 is the next chip from the, um, from Espresso Systems. Uh, they learned uh, uh, from their mistakes and uh, they are adding Bluetooth, so it will be Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Uh, they're adding more, so the chip has more pins, there is more uh, GPIOs. They are added uh, I2C and the uh, hardware of, of uh, PWM. They second core. Yeah, there, there is a, oh, did I, I didn't mention? Yeah, second core, yeah, there is a second core, uh, which, so we were first, when we heard that they were adding a second core, we said, oh, great, now we have this SDK and all the SMP issues. <coughs> I mean, these, these people, I mean, the, the people don't know about function declaration, like what do they know about locking, I wonder. Um, <laughs> um, so, no, but fortu fortunately, fortunately, it's, uh, it looks like it, first it will be able to, uh, <coughs> it will be possible to turn it off, run it as an independent core with a shared memory region, or run it in SMP configuration, like, uh, please don't. Um, and, um, yeah, so it has more RAM um, to begin with. It has as it has uh, the same uh, uh, SPI transparent SPI mapping of memory regions to SPI, and it looks like the memory regions will be even more flexible in the configuration. So we'll be able to change the division between the amount of IRAM you have and DRAM, and how much goes to one core to the second core. Uh, the silicon is in beta. We actually do have beta silicon, and we are starting to play with it. Um, so we plan to be the release date is in uh, a couple months. Uh, so we plan to have full support <coughs> by, by the time it goes general availability, SmartJS should be there. Um, uh, maybe not supporting because some of the, for example, Bluetooth is currently completely uh, undocumented and unsupported in the beta SDK, so we cannot even start on that. 
Um, but as much as we can, we will have by the day of the release. And it's, uh, yeah, it's quite interesting. The SDK, I, I'm happy to say, the SDK and ESP32 looks like a more uh, mature, at least they started, looks like maybe they hired some new people that actually <coughs> understand more, and it's, it's looking, looking much better. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, we, the, the future looks bright with ESP32. Um, you have two minutes left for questions. Um, yeah, do you have any questions? <laughs> Do you have any idea of the price point of the ESP32? Uh, Do you have any idea of the price point? Yeah, price point. Um, uh, well, I don't imagine, like, they understand that their biggest advantage is that under $2, because otherwise people wouldn't uh, wouldn't um, uh, call, uh, wouldn't put up with all the, all the hassle. So I don't. But I, I don't expect it to be much more expensive. Uh, bro, we have one here to show you what it's just by coincidence. Is it the 32? <laughs> yeah, 32. But no, this is the 8266. This ah, is the okay. 12E module. This is the old one. The one I have, yeah. No SPI, the SPI mapping I refer to is basically when your region address in certain region gets transparently mapped into SPI region that's in SPI flash on ESP, which is quite handy. We, we do uh, OTA updates that way, so we keep two separate images. On, uh, on TI, there is nothing like that. Um, the, I think uh, the ship that ships with two variety of modules. But see, the problem with um, for us, at least for us, on TI, the flash capacity is irrelevant because only part of that can be used for code. I mean, you can write data. I think the ships with the eight megabits, one megabyte flash. Uh, the, the code space is really the constraint for us on, on TI. I, I was wondering what's the uh, actual limit for uh, the amount of flash <coughs> that should be released in the ESP because you know, now we have flash chips with 60 megabytes or 64 megabytes. So there is I don't a know if, uh, uh, there is a limit, I think, <coughs> on the size of the window, code window you can map. And uh, if I'm not, I, I didn't work with, with that in particular, but I heard, I think it's uh, eight megabits, so, so it's a one megabyte window. But you can access flash via SPI for data. You can mm -hmm. access flash beyond that. that there is, it's not, there is no problem. Although I personally have not seen and have not attached uh, flash more than four megabytes. Thank you very much. I have to finish there.